Hello, bravs. We're back with Shakespeare's Sweetheart by Sarah Hawks Sterling, a 1905 historical novel which poses as a biography. Chapter 5. Oh, cursed spire. Ha, what means this? I heard Sir, Sir Thomas Lucy exclaim. As realizing on the instant the imprudence of my action, I cowered down beside Will, muffling my face in my cloak. Seize him, varlets, seize him. What new villainy is villain, villainy is this? Two stout men stepped forward immediately. Ere they reached me, however, attention was diverted from me, as if knowing that I had need of them. Him, Will stirred, opened his eyes in dazed fashion, then sat upright. The next moment, com comprehending the situation in a flash, he was on his feet. Nay, he cried, standing between me and the glare of the torches, and making a quick gesture betwixt command and appeal. Nay, I protest, Sir Thomas Lucy, this friend is no Stratford lad, and hath not taken part in this night's business. Prithee, therefore, bid thy servants forbear. Will's body shielding me, I raised my head breathlessly and peeped at Sir Thomas with wide eyes of apprehension. The torch's light shone upon, shone full upon him. I'm butchering this, I understand, and revealed the look of satisfied malice and sneering triumph on his pale puritanical face. Aha, he said, slowly replying to Will. A friend, sayest, a friend of thine, most like a poor recommendation. What ho! More torches, more tower. More torches there. Will had done his best to shield me and had failed. He gave a deep, despairing sigh as the lights came flashing towards us. I rose, trembling my cloak. I can't do it. I rose, trembling my cloak still wrapped about me. But again, the diversion occurred. The heavy door behind Sir Thomas opened ponderously, and on its threshold appeared three unexpected figures. Lady Lucy, Mistress Mary Shakespeare, and my grandam. At first, reset. At sight of them, I stood as if turned to stone. I had never, myself, I can't do it. At sight of them, I stood as if turned to stone. I had nerved myself to meet exposure and recognition, but I had not expected treachery. Will made no sign of surprise. He stood immovable, his arms folded. Sir Thomas shot a quick glance at us both, then gave a rapid order to his servants. In reply, the latter began the difficult task of removing the captive Stratford lads to the house for safekeeping. It was an ardu arduous duty that they strove to perform, for their prisoners were most unruly. The air was filled with mocking protest profane threatenings and rough jests at Sir Thomas's expense. There was last made the knight turn purple with rage, and he was restrained from setting upon the saucy knaves himself, only by the cries and pleadings of his lady. Finally, however, the task was accomplished. The last Stratford lads were forced into the house by his captors. The great door closed upon them all, and a brief lull ensued. Sir Thomas, choking and sputtering with anger, at length managed to regain some slight measure of self-control. When he had reached this point, he put his lady impatiently aside and beckoned to Will and me. At the summons, Will offered me his hand in silence. I laid my cold fingers with his. So, like two children, we went forward to meet our fate. Will Shakespeare began Sir Thomas pompously as we finally came to a standstill before him. "'Tis a mad and vicious deed that thou didst plan this night. "'The Lord be praised that thou wers, wast, wast, wast hindered from carrying it out. "'Will gazed at him without a word. "'The knight's whining piety was so obviously an outer crust of his real nature. "'Twas a convenient coat to show a goodly outside to the world. "'But within there dwelt how poor and mean a soul." Thou hast done me good service, Dame Hathaway, the knight continued, condescendingly turning to my grandam. He was evidently somewhat confused by Will's steadfast, scornful eyes. I shall not forget it, and the service is Mistress Shakespeare's as well as mine, responded my grandam. Her eyes fixed full upon my face. I told her of the plot I overheard, and it was by her advice that I came hither to seek thy worship. 
I trust that thou wilt not forget the promise thou didst make that my granddaughters share, and this escapade shall remain unknown, except to those here present. This boon, Sir Thomas, thou hast granted me in return for my warning. As for Master Shakespeare, his mother must speak. She learned today for the first of her son's entanglement with my granddaughter, and heard it to my sorrow and shame, added Mistress Shakespeare in a low, clear voice, so like Will's, that my heart was strangely stirred. I deemed my son a man of honor, worthy of his art and blood. Never before in all of his life hath he been guilty of deception, nor concealed aught from me. Then indeed Will started, as if stung. He made an impetuous step towards her. Sweet mother, he began eagerly, imploringly, dear lady, say not so. Thou knowst not all. I could not tell thee sooner. Indeed, indeed, deception and dishonor were far from my thoughts. I have longed for the day when I could bring her to thee, could give thee a daughter. His mother made a gesture of abhorrence and cast a fleeting, scornful glance at me. Thou didst intend to marry her, she said slowly, and the disdain in her voice cut me to the very heart. This passes. Thou wouldst have taken as they wedded wife this mad woman's daughter, this bastard. Will's imperative uplifted hand made her pause. His eyes blazed with anger. He turned from Mr. Shakespeare and drew me to his breast with an exquisite movement of protection. By that speech, thou hast lost a son, mother, he said quietly, and the calm decision of his words was more effective than any storm of rage. Then he spoke to me with infinite tenderness. Thou harassed, beloved. Tis as I feared, and yet I hoped also. This is why I sought to wed thee as I did. All my life shall recompense thee for those words, sweetheart. His voice was low, but perfectly distinct. His mother turned scarlet, and the tears rushed to her eyes. Despising me before, surely she hated me now but Will's self-control was an inheritance. She turned calmly to Sir Thomas. Do with him as thou wilt. Some madness soothly affects him, or some potent spell hath bewitched him. Strive, prithee, to bring him to his senses. Dame Hathaway, I think. Thank thee for thy warning. Lady Lucy, I crave thy hospitality for the night. On the morrow I will return to Stratford. So saying with a stately curtsy to Sir Thomas, and Lady Lucy, in a gracious inclination to my grandam, Mistress Shakespeare, entered the house. The knight cleared his throat pompously as she disappeared. A foolish son is the heaviness of his mother, he observed sanctimoniously, rolling his eyes heavenward. And the way of the transgressor is hard. Thy sin hath found thee out, Will Shakespeare, and waste no words, Sir Thomas, said Will, interrupting him unceremoniously. I am in thy power, as thou knowest right well. Do with me as thou wilt. The knight opened his mouth to utter another high-sounding sentence, but this time, to my surprise, my grandam interposed. Her face was white, and her voice sounded curiously husky. Sir Thomas, she said, thou hast said that I have done thee good service this night. I have now a further boon to crave than the one thou hast already granted me. Prithee, let me speak to these two for a brief space in private. Sir Thomas looked at her amazed, but her face was inscrutable. He muttered to himself for a moment, gazing upon her with suspicion, but finally his countenance cleared. She had indeed done him a great service. The favor she asked was a harmless one. His triumph over his enemies had been so complete that he could afford to be somewhat magnanimous. Have thy wish, he said at length, albeit somewhat ungraciously. I will remain just within. If he should attempt escape, one call will suffice to bring me. And with that he made his exit, his lady fluttering about him like a bird around its mate. The instant he was gone, Will's self-restraint flew to the winds. He caught me yet closer to him, murmuring passionate, caressing words, explanations, apologies. It was as if he could not do enough to make amends for his mother's cruel scorn. But stay, he said, suddenly checking himself. The time is brief. Tell me, sweetheart, tell me that thou dost trust me still. Oh, never fear, dear love. Happiness shall yet be ours, and this past woe shall seem to us as naught 
see Nan, and he gently turned my face towards the tranquil scene beyond. See where charcoal lies in the moonlight, calm and heavenly fair? Even so, one day shall be our wedded bliss, Nan. Dear Nan, my sweetheart, my wife. I murmured a tender word or two, and laid my hands in his with perfect trust. Past troubles, future perplexities were as naught. He bent his head and kissed me. Light of my life, I thank thee. A time will come, I hope, when thy trust shall be rewarded. A time when thou wilt be proud that thou art Shakespeare's sweetheart. Of that she is proud now, said a low voice behind us. We turned with a start. We had entirely forgotten my grandam's presence. She is proud now, and well may she be, she added to my complete surprise. Will looked at her sternly. Why, do, the, why thou didst choose to play the spy I know not, Dame Hathaway, he said somewhat bitterly. Methinks thou didst so, so scarce effectually. I brought thy granddaughter here this night, meaning to take her back to Shottery as my wedded wife. That she is not such at this moment is thy own fault and thine alone. I answered my grand granddam in an odd, breathless tone, and her hands made a strange, wavering movement. As if she besought his pardon. Aye, so I heard thee tell thy mother. I have wronged thee, Will Shakespeare, wronged thee much. I crave thy forgiveness. I had a daughter once. Tis an old story. But I feared less that daughter's daughter. She paused abruptly. I cannot make amends, she went on presently. Yet I can at least explain and hope for the future. Tis true I overheard but part of thy plans. I understood that Nan was coming hither with thee and that she would be the only woman present. Ere thou hadst gone, I slipped away to Stratford and told thy mother all I knew. She was amazed and displeased, as thou hast seen, and advised that Sir Thomas Lucy be warned. When I returned to Shottery, it was very late. Thou hadst gone, and Nan had retired to her chamber. I had left my door closed that she might think I slept within. When I returned from my interview with thy mother, I opened it most cautiously, yet it creaked villainously. And again, when I closed it, this, hear it, Nan, A, I answered, but thought it a dream. I had no idea that thou wert not in the house when I sought my room. Today, my granddam went on, I went to Mistress Shakespeare as we had planned, and we came together to Sir Thomas with our story. I meant all for the best. Wilt not believe it, Nan. Wilt not believe it, Master Shakespeare. Sir Thomas has promised me that Nan's share in this night's doing shall remain a secret. When thy punishment is over, I when Will said more gloomily than I had ever heard him speak, Sir Thomas is not a man to forgive easily, nor to punish lightly. But he cannot do more than imprison thee, my grandam urged, and when thou art free, what sudden impulse caused the thought I know not, but at that moment an idea occurred to me. Free, I whispered. Never fear, Will, thou shalt be free soon. I know a way. He shook his head. What thou meanst, I know not, sweetheart, but free I shall be one day, assuredly. And until then, the great door creaked, and we heard Thomas Lucy's voice. Will turned hurriedly to my granddam, and spoke with sudden passion. Dame Hathaway, I trust thee. I must perforce guard her for me until I may make her mine, and God forgive thee if thou dost play us false. And that's all for that, bravs. Goodbye. Goodbye.